Hello, folks. Tony here from the Expat Chat Podcast. Nice to have you along today. And uh, for those of you who are listening in podcast land, the show is a little bit different because we're actually doing a live stream. If you don't know what a live stream is, well, I didn't really either until about two weeks ago. But we are doing a video hookup uh, via the website Blab. And we have a very special guest with us today who is also on video. We're looking at each other. And we have guests on board who can ask questions. So um, exciting new format. We're hoping it's going to be interesting to try in the future. And uh, fingers crossed today go well. But uh, let's talk about today's guest. And um, we've got a very special welcome out to Barbara Weevil from Holden the Donut Cultural Travels. Hello, Barbara. Hello. How are you? Very well. Thank you. Nice to have you along. Now, we've spoken to Barbara before. Some of you will know who she is. For those of you who don't, uh, Barbara has been on the road now for somewhere in the area of nine years. Uh, she's visited over 65 countries in that time. And her holeinthedonut.com uh, blog is one of the top 50 travel blogs in the world. So she is very well equipped to be discussing the topic of conversation today, which is Eastern Europe, uh, where she spent the last couple of summers. But before we get into it, Barbara, just for the benefit of those who don't know your history, do you want to um, tell us how you got involved in being a, a permanent traveler, what your old life was like, and, and the catalyst that got you going? Sure. Um, I spent 36 years in corporate life, uh, hating pretty much every minute of it. Um, and really all I had ever wanted to do was be a travel writer and photographer. But, you know, life kind of gets in the way and you have to make a living. And I went in another direction. And um, I, it's a kind of a long story, but I ended up getting very sick. I got a very bad case of Lyme disease, um, which it took them five years to diagnose. And by the time they found it, I was pretty sick. Uh, and so I kind of looked up from my sick bed one day and said, is this all there is? Uh, I was terrified that I was going to die before I got to do any of the things that I'd always dreamed of. And I made a promise to myself that if I could get well, I would walk away from everything and put a backpack on and head out into the wild blue yonder to see everything that I'd always wanted to see. And that's what I did. And that was, uh, I left my job the last day of 2006. I headed out, I think it was March in 2007, um, and uh, I've been traveling ever since. It's It's been a bit of a, a process because I started out in the beginning. I had an apartment. I gave up my home. I had an apartment, but gradually I, I was traveling more and staying there less, and it didn't make sense to keep it, um, and so I finally let the apartment go as well, and since the end of 2009, I've been traveling full time with no uh, home base. So the world is that's what I do. I have my, my suitcase. That's it. <laughs> the world is literally your oyster. And who says good things can't come out of illness? It's certainly been to your benefit. <laughs> exactly. Okay. It's kind of sad that it takes that kind of a, uh, you know, a, a brick wall for us to realize what we really want to do with our lives. Yeah, well, that's right. And it is those moments that make you take stock, really, isn't it? So um, it your story is a fascinating one. We, we've enjoyed hearing your travels as you've been going around the world and the experiences you've had. And you're a great tribute to the fact that age is no barrier to doing these things. And being a single woman is certainly no barrier either. And so uh, we find it very inspirational talking to you. But today we're going to focus on Eastern Europe um, because that's where you spent the last couple of summers. And we're going to talk about why it's becoming such a popular place for travel. Before we jump into that, if any of our uh, people live on the stream want to jump in with questions, uh, there's a little box on the left hand side, which according to the instructions, you put forward slash Q, then type a question and it should work. So if anyone wants to have a go and let me know whether it does work, jump in there with your questions. And as we go forward, we'll, uh, we'll give Barbara the chance to answer some of those. So but let's, let's start by defining where we're covering. I mean, Eastern Europe is a fairly large area. And it's probably fair to say we're going to focus mainly on Southeast Europe, but just run us through some of the countries you've been in in the last uh, couple of years. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, in the last couple of years, I've, I've uh, focused basically on Asia and Europe over the last couple of years, but um, I, I have had a fascination for the Balkan Peninsula in Europe and spend a lot of time there. Uh, I'm currently in Thailand where I'm going to spend a couple of months. Um, and then in February, I go to Myanmar. But um, uh, I've, I've been to all six, six continents. I haven't been to Antarctica yet because I have to get on a ship to do that and I get seasick. So I'm, one of these days I'll get a prescription for, for some seasickness medicine and do that. But um, gosh, Mexico, 
Um, I've been I went all over Mexico for four and a half months on buses, um, Peru, Ecuador, all over Southeast Asia, Nepal, China, um, golly, uh, Norway. I sailed up around the north to the Russian border. Uh, gosh, <laughs> just kind of been all over the map. Well, in terms of today, obviously, we're looking at Eastern Europe. So the main countries we'll talk about uh, within that area, we're talking Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, much of the old Yugoslavia. Um, all of the old Yugoslavia. All of the old Yugoslavia, Albania, uh, right. Moldova as well. Uh, this Moldova, is the I haven't, haven't been to that. Okay. The question is whether or not that's Europe or Asia. Greece is in there as well. Okay. Well, let's start with your favourite or your favourite city anyway, which is Budapest in Hungary. And just, just share with us what you love about it. Uh, you know, Budapest is often referred to as the Paris of the East, and it really is. I had the opportunity um, this summer to uh, sail, uh, did what was called the Grand European Tour with Viking River Cruises. And we left from Amsterdam and sailed down a series of rivers and, and canals ending up in Budapest. And, and it is Budapest, by the way. Um, most people don't know that, but that's how I would said locally. But we sailed in after dark, about nine o'clock at night. And uh, for those who don't know the city, it's uh, amazingly illuminated. Every castle, every palace, every bridge is lit up with these amazing lights. And so it was like sailing into a fairyland. Uh, but beyond that, it, it is... I stayed a month after um, after arriving with Viking, and I had been there before, so I knew I liked the city. It has so much culture. It has um, theaters um, that where you can go for uh, opera performances and plays and and musical concerts. And the government makes sure that those kind of cultural experiences are very cheap, so you can attend uh, a jazz festival for five dollars. You know. Um, it's the the restaurants are amazing. There are four Michelin star restaurants in Budapest alone. Uh, four years ago, when I went, it was really hard to find vegetarian food. I'm vegetarian, technically pescatarian, because I'll eat a little fish now and again. And I had trouble finding food because the Balkans are famous for meat and potatoes and sort of heavy food. But this time, there are now at least two fully vegetarian restaurants. And almost every place I went to had vegetarian options. So it's really kind of an up and coming, coming city. It's walkable. It doesn't feel over touristed. Um, it's full of monuments. Um, it's the Danube runs right through the center of it. Uh, it splits the town into what used to be two separate towns of Buda and Pest. And now, of course, it's Budapest, but the, the river runs through the uh, middle of it, and you have a much different feel in the Buddha side than, it, than you do in the Pest side. Uh, there are spas. The city's famous for its thermal spas. I hit four of them last time when I was there. Lots to see and do there. So in terms of cost, then, I'm fascinated you're talking about Michelin-style restaurants. Obviously, if you go to Paris or somewhere and dine like that, you're paying a small fortune. But mm. relatively speaking, is it cheap dining to have this sort of Michelin experience in Budapest? I am not. I'm one of those people who eats to live, not lives to eat. And so uh, I love food, but I'm not one that will go out and spend $200 on a meal. And um, I also don't drink. So... Uh, I'm a little leery when I go into, you know, what are called four-star restaurants or whatever. But um, the one that I went to uh, called Wine Kitchen, I can't remember the name in Hungarian right now, Borconio, something like that, uh, is the most recent addition to the Michelin star restaurants there. It's a very casual place. You don't need to dress up. I had a seven-course meal there. It uh, of course, I didn't pay for it. I, I was hosted there, but it would have been sixty-five dollars. Wow! What would you pay for would that you, in other cities? Oh, in the oh, I mean, the, across the street from it, there's another place, or two blocks away, and it would have been one hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. Uh, I did go to another place, um, which had for years been touted as one of the top restaurants, and again, the name escapes me. I'm sorry, but um, it was horrible, and it, it cost a fortune. <laughs> you don't always get what you pay for. Yeah. Well, 
I guess the thing with uh, a lot of these old communist countries is their rate of development. I mean, I know communism fell, what, 25 years ago. Um, but obviously, there's still quite a lag in terms of what's going on in these countries to what's happening in Western Europe. There is. Uh, I would say that the major metropolitan areas are doing much better, but the rural areas are still suffering. And that is due in part, if you can believe it, to the East, uh, the European Union, because um, uh, the European Commission, which is the regulatory body that sets the laws and regulations for the e European Union, has enacted a lot of what I think are kind of crazy laws. So for instance, I go to Eastern Hungary quite often. Uh, I have friends there in this tiny little village of 400 people. Um, and I stay in a house there for $10 a night that has all the utilities and Wi-Fi. And um, it, uh, it is a, uh, a farming village. Uh, everybody in this village, every house used to have their own cow uh, their own chickens, their own pigs. Uh, they would, there was a processing plant in the middle of town and a truck would come around every day, pick up the milk from the cows, um, the, take it to the plant, process it. The people would retain whatever milk they needed for their own use and they would get paid on the spot for what they sold to the processing plant. And this, they live sustainably this way. They sold some eggs, they kept some eggs. Same with the, 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 uh, the pigs. There was a truck that came around once a year from Italy that would buy any pigs that they wanted to sell. Same with cattle from um, the Ukraine. Now that the EU has all these rules, even owning one cow makes them a producer. And they have to meet not only health, heavier uh, health standards, but they also have to pay taxes on the production of the milk, which they couldn't afford. So... And the plant had to close down because it couldn't meet the EU standards. And so now they have basically destroyed a sustainable uh, way of life. And these people have to buy their cheese and their milk from, from the store now. So they're really struggling. Um, and of course, the EU has helped because they've provided some funds to do things like uh, upgrade sewage systems and build roads and all that. But it's, it's just not enough for them. Uh, and it's questionable in these cases whether the EU has been more of a, a help or a hindrance. I guess that's making a bigger gap between the cities, as you say, and the smaller, uh, uh, smaller it regions. It is. Well. It is. But I find the, the 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 rural areas to be the most fascinating areas because this is where you can experience the traditional culture. Well, I was going to ask you about that because I think most people tend to think of the larger cities when they go places, and and Budapest is probably the example. It's it has come into the radar over the last few years more as a tourism place. But do you find that, obviously, when you get into the rural areas, that's where the genuine experience and the best part of travel is? Well, and I, I have to say that Budapest is an exception to that rule because I find that I can still connect with local culture um, in that big city. I don't feel overwhelmed like I did, for instance, in Prague. Um, the tourism had changed the city. I, I think it has retained its authenticity. But yes, in the rural areas, you really get a taste, especially, you know, I don't speak a lot of Hungarian. I know how to ask for black coffee without sugar. But, <laughs> you know, it, 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 I go to this little village where I, I don't speak enough to really communicate with a lot of the people. But I get by. I'm, people are fascinated by the fact that I'm even there. Uh, what's this crazy American lady who doesn't speak any Hungary, Hungarian doing in our little village? And they, they come with me, they take me by the hand and they make me pick cherries from their trees and, <laughs> and plums from their trees. It's crazy. That's crazy. Cool. Well, the good thing is when you're places where they, they don't really know what to expect from tourists, you're not going to get hassled, are you? You're not going to be done over for the selling of goods and all the usual carry on that the places that start to get a bit of a tourist name do. Quite the opposite, yeah. You don't get any of that. In fact, they bend over backwards to try and make sure you have a great time. And and people in general are so kind. Um, that's one of the things I had to learn, or shall I say learn to accept about traveling, especially solo. I was an independent, strong-willed businesswoman who didn't need anybody's help. I could do whatever I needed. And suddenly, when you're on the road in places where you don't speak the language and you're not familiar with the terrain and you have to figure out transportation. You have to learn that it's okay to ask for help and accept it. And I can't tell you the number of times where people in Mexico, I, I asked for directions 
to find a little van that was taking me to a um, Pueblo Magico, which are magic towns is what that translates to. And not only did the woman happily help me, she took me by the hand and walked two blocks with me to the bus stop. Wow. So that happens all the time. Yeah. Uh, and this is something we talk to a lot of people about. I mean, it's very easy to be cynical about the world these days. And yet time and time and time again, we hear from people traveling overseas, the generosity of strangers, the the willingness to put themselves out for people they don't even know. It, it is a truth to humanity. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're a lost cause quite yet, are we? Not yet. <laughs> well, let's move on from Hungary. We'll, we'll talk, um, we're going to talk about some of the places that are a bit more off the beaten track. But the next one I did want to talk to you about was Croatia. And I know... Probably in terms of Eastern Europe, it's probably the most fastest growing, I would imagine, tourist area at the moment. Croatia has been very much on the radar for people in the last 10 years. And I know you're a, you're a big fan of the country. What, what's, what's the appeal for it for you? Oh, uh, part of the appeal for me may have been that I came from Slovenia into Croatia and I found the Croatians to be so much more welcoming. Um, the, uh, Slovenia is a beautiful country, but um, not really up to snuff on the tourism infrastructure. Uh, Croatia has done a much better job of that. It's also much cheaper. Um, it, there seems to be a perception that Croatia is expensive. That was my uh, understanding before I got there, but it's not what I found. Uh, it has um, amazing historic sites. The um, uh, the seaside, you know, it's on the Adriatic, and uh, towns are just uh, fabulous. Um, Split was particularly beautiful, I thought. It has Split developed around a site called Diocletian's Palace, which was uh, a private home for an emperor, um, one of the last Roman emperors, and it then became uh, not only his palace but a, a town, uh, a walled city, and then expanded from there. And it's it's just the most gorgeous. Um, they have a, a seaside promenade promenade called the Riva that's uh, paved in marble stones, and uh, you have little um, you know the the cafes there. One of the things you have to get used to in Eastern Europe is that the cafes don't serve food; they serve coffee, alcoholic drinks, and soft drinks. So people will come a couple times a day, plop down in these cafes to have a cup of coffee and just sit and watch the world go by on the Riva. Uh, and you're looking out at, at these stunning blue waters, you know? So no meals in the cafes is purely a drinking location? It is. And it's uh, the, a lot of coffee drinking goes, goes on in Eastern Europe. Um, and in, let me think, yes, in Croatia, uh, they are called kafanas. And people start the day. They they go in the morning just to have their cup of coffee, and then they go, you know, a couple three times a day. And Bosnia, especially, the Bosnians will sit down at a cafe and they have teeny tiny little cups of coffee. You know, it's not more than a, a gulp, but they will stop for ten minutes, chat with people, and gulp down their their little uh, espresso. It's about living a lifestyle, isn't it? In many of these countries, they they it is they. You used the term before, you don't live to eat, you eat to live, or I probably got that the wrong way around. But most of these places are very much about living and probably something you need to learn as Westerners, isn't it? It is. And and um, uh, frankly, I, I think that this is one of the big attractions for me. Uh, I think life in the United States has become way too much about work, money, and buying things. And I think in Eastern Europe, they still understand the value of rest, relaxation, spending time with friends and family. Uh, and Asia is very much the same way. I, I was asking someone yesterday what they thought the biggest social problem in Thailand was, and they said that people are too busy working now that they don't spend time with their family. That's kind of going on around in, in a lot of developed places around the world. Mm. And it's uh, becoming more and more of a problem, I think, rather than going the other way. But there are exceptions, mm. people like you and others that are uh, showing the light as to what should be done. But talk about... Um, much of what's gone on in terms of the, that area. Obviously, the old Yugoslavia, as most people will know, going back, you know, 15, 20 years, there was a lot of fighting going on. And for some places, it's very hard to get past that previous experience of, of what it's like. And people still tar with the brush of the fact that I can't go there, there's minefields still in the ground and so on. 
Is that holding a lot of these areas back from developing? I think so, but I think that that's rapidly changing. And let me let me say that there. Yeah, I think you have to separate Eastern Europe into two areas. Um, and two years ago, my focus was on the Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and Greece, um, which were not part of um, the ex Yugoslavia. And the challenge, especially for I would, uh, you know, I can speak to Americans better than I can Australians or. Uh, Europeans, but the challenge for Americans especially is that we don't really understand, um, we don't know what the countries are that used to be Yugoslavia. We don't understand the history of Yugoslavia. I frankly didn't understand the history of Yugoslavia, uh, and I, I do that a little bit on purpose because I think it's good for my writing to go in without expectations. But um, there is a perception that it is still dangerous. And indeed, there are areas where there are still mines. You can't really wander off the beaten track too much. I mean, you can go to cities and villages, but you don't want to walk out in the countryside unless you know where you're going, because there are some mines. Um, and um, then the other part, aside from the Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, Greece, is, and I'll go through those countries real quickly, if you don't mind, um, the ex-Yugoslavian countries are Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Macedonia, Montenegro, Kosovo. Uh, and then uh, although Albania was not part of Yugoslavia, it's the history is tied to it fairly closely. Um, and so it's uh, I went there as well this year. Uh, and I would say probably in Albania, and Kosovo, and to some degree Bosnia and Serbia, people were alarmed that I was going there. Um, oh, you can't go there. Oh, it's dangerous. They're still at war. There's fighting going on. Well, no, there isn't. Um, the It's like any place else in the world right now. Are there things that happen? Sure. I mean, is anywhere... 100% safe? No. But in general, these are all safe countries mm -hmm. to visit. And the people are so, especially, for instance, in Bosnia, my gosh, the people were so thrilled that there was even a tourist in their midst. Um, I was uh, welcomed into a home. Well, let me, let me tell you briefly, when I was on the Viking River cruise, I met a bartender there who uh, was from Bosnia, from a town called Bihać in the north, far northwestern corner. And he sat down with me one night and said, where are you going in Bosnia? And I said, well, I know I'm going to Mostar and I'm going to um, Sarajevo. He said, oh, you have to come to Bihać. And he showed me on the map and he told me all about it and um, made me promise that when I, when I got to that area that I would call his wife, which I did, and uh, his I was taken to his father and mother's house by her, so her in-laws, spent one entire evening with them. Uh, them, they didn't speak any English, so uh, their daughter-in-law was with me and she translated and we talked about the war and what they went through and um, the lasting effects of it and what was going on in Bosnia right now and how difficult it was to live there um, economically. Um, and they have invited me to come back and stay in their home. Not only do they want me to come and stay in their home, and they will fix special food for me as a vegetarian, but they are arranging for me to go back to a place called Plitvisa Lakes over the border in Croatia where they know someone who has a house that I can use. It's amazing to me. This is My life just runs this thread of synchronicity where I, I, I allow people to tell me where I should go. Uh, and those are experiences you won't get through the normal system of, you know, traveling on an air conditioned bus, staying in hotels and, uh, and that sort of thing. But for those people who still prefer the old way of doing it um, or the more expensive way of doing it, what's the infrastructure like in these places? I mean, you've got your five star hotels if you want them, your top quality restaurants if you want them, you can pay for, for the full service. Well, you do. Um, it's, um, I, I am not a, a luxury traveler. I occasionally have an opportunity to do luxury like, you know, sponsored uh, trips. But I would say that in almost every place that I go, there is an opportunity to go um, 
with a, um, a higher end hotel. And I'll give you an example. In Tirana, the capital of Albania, there is the Tirana International Hotel, which is right on in the center of town on Skanderberg Square. I actually did stay there one night, and I think it was $85, $90. So not terribly expensive, um, but a first-class hotel. And I used to be of the opinion that people shouldn't do tours, but I've changed my mind because... I, th I think it's more important that people travel. It doesn't matter how they travel. Uh, I would encourage them to get out if they're on a tour uh, to spend some time doing some outside activities where you can try and connect with the local people and have a more local experience. But I think that tours sometimes are a good way for people who might be a little uncomfortable about traveling, especially if they're solo, to um, get to know a place. Uh, to the point where they might feel comfortable yeah. coming back and that's on right. And sometimes you need that first experience to be comfortable with the place. But it's a very good point. Even if you like staying in the luxury mm -hmm. hotels and you don't want to put yourself out there too much, there's nothing to stop you walking out the front door of the hotel and going and talking to people and seeing where it leads you. Because as you've proven in your case, uh, who knows what experiences you can open up from there. I've actually got a question here, which um, thanks right. to Duncan and Jane Dempster-Smith from the Two Travel Two team. They've just asked a question here about the exploring the cost of uh, daily travel. Now, you mentioned before about, I think, uh, was it Serbia is more expensive than Croatia, but what are you looking at to travel your way um, in, in terms of costs through some of these countries? Well, Europe in general is a more um, high-priced destination than many of the places that I go, but I, um, I tend to try and uh, maintain a budget of $50 a day uh, in Europe. And I achieve that most of the time. Uh, there are places that are more expensive. I'm certainly not going to do that in Paris or in London. But uh, in the, um, and that's one of the reasons that I was so interested in Eastern Europe and especially the Balkans because their prices have not gone to the point of, of Western Europe yet. Uh, and and I, I imagine they'll creep up, but for right now they're extremely affordable and I can do travel in any of those countries for $30 a day or less, and I'm talking about that including my food and my accommodations uh, and some minor transportation like local buses or a taxi cab here or there, um, um, but but not certainly my airfare. That, that comes, the airfare is probably the most expensive part of my life, and I try not to fly any more than okay. I absolutely So I average of 30 per day on your own. Obviously, for a couple, you might be looking at 45, 50 per day. But in terms of um, the places that are the cheapest, Croatia is cheaper than Serbia. If you had to rank them in terms of affordability, which is the cheapest in that area? Well, let me go back and correct you. Um, oh, Slovenia sorry. is more expensive than Croatia. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the probably... I would say it, I think it's the most expensive uh, that I've come across in that area. Um, Budapest is is remarkably inexpensive. Um, I may at some point want to put down roots and I can rent an apartment there, all utilities included, furnished, uh, and including Wi-Fi uh, for about 350 euros a month which would be about mm, $370 a month for Americans. Um, the, um, the cheapest place was okay. Kosovo. Uh, I bought a bag of fruit, oh, I, 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 a tomato, two peaches, uh, some plums, a bunch of bananas for less than a dollar and a half. It, it was amazingly cheap in Kosovo. Um, and there, you know, I'm a big fan of hostels. Um, and in many places, I like to stay in um, apartments, apart, apartment rentals like Airbnb or, mm -hmm. you know, one of those sites. And so you can do this very affordably. Although in, in Kosovo, I did stay at a, a fairly new uh, hotel and it was, I think, $20 a night. Uh, so I, I would say Kosovo is extremely cheap. Um, Serbia is very cheap as well. And I have to say that I loved uh, Serbia. I struggled a bit with the food because it's very, they eat meat for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. 
Um, so I was relegated to stuffed pepper. I ate a lot of peppers in Serbia. You know, they make them 16 different ways. Um, but it is extremely inexpensive and a lot to see. It's a beautiful country. Um, then um, Albania was, was fairly inexpensive as well. Um, trying to think. Ma um, Macedonia was another big surprise for me. Uh, very inexpensive. I stayed in a private apartment there. Uh, and then I was there for three or four nights and then I moved to another little hotel that again was only $20 a night. And had I looked further, I might have been able to get one for $15 a night. Um, and then I, uh, people told me from the capital of uh, Skopje in Macedonia that I needed to go to o Ohrid, which is on the far um, western border with Albania. And it is a beautiful, pristine, crystal clear lake like I have, I don't think I've ever seen anything like it before. And there's something going on in this place. And I'm so glad that I listened to people who insisted I needed to go. I decided to go for three days and 10 days later, or nine days later, I was still there. And I had a hard time uh, dragging myself away from the place. Uh, it, it was one of those incredibly spiritual places. I, I it's, some people will laugh when I say that, but I just felt in my gut that there was something special about it. Everybody would uh, congregate along the lakefront at night under on tables that had little umbrellas over them and, and uh, you know, watch the sunset and sip coffee and then have their dinner. And one of the great things about Eastern Europe is nobody's rushing you to get done with your meal. So you might have to wait for a table. But once you get one, you can stay as long as you want. And the waiters don't hassle you. You can have a three-hour dinner. You can you can spend an hour after dinner sipping a coffee. Sounds ideal. Just talking about um, mm -hmm. those off-the-beaten-track sort of places, I mean, what, what's your thoughts on places to visit? Because there are so many places out there that get, I don't know, they've almost got their own marketing department, you know, of, of you need to go and see this, you need to go and see that. And often people can get there and it's a disappointment. And yet there's places around the world that people just don't even know about, isn't there? I mean, you've given an example there. Uh, Bled Castle, is that another one? Somebody said to me, uh, is it Bled that is, is a fascinating place worth visiting? Have you been there? I have been. Uh, that's in uh, um, Slovenia. And what was really interesting is I'd, I'd seen and heard a lot of things about Slovenia. And as I said before, I don't. I tend not to do much research on anything, so that I am surprised by my destination. But I'd heard a lot about Slovenia, and it was sort of high on my list as a must-see. Um, and I again met the most wonderful people in Slovenia, but um, I was uh, disappointed with the big tourist destination of Bled, Lake Bled. Um, uh, yeah, it was nice to go up to the castle, but there's nothing in the castle and you pay pretty dearly to get in it, even if all you want to do is um, have lunch there, but you have to pay to get inside before you can do that. Uh, and um, it was, to me, over-touristed. And I have to say, I went to, while I say that the um, tourism folks were not particularly helpful, there was one exception and that was the tourism office in, um, Oh dear, Ljubljana, which is the capital. And she said to me, because I was staying in Ljubljana and I did a day trip up to Triglav National Park, which is where um, uh, Lake Bled is just outside of the park. And she said, uh, go to Bohin first. And Bohin is the other lake. Uh, and it is inside of the national park. And she said, and then you can catch a shuttle bus down to Lake Bled. And they're only about 20, 30 minutes apart. Well, I got to Lake Bohin. It was so beautiful that I decided to walk, take the trail around the whole thing. It's just kind of spur of the moment for me. It's nice when you don't have plans, you can do that sort of thing. And I asked people, how long does it take to walk around the, the lake? Oh, two hours, maybe two and a half. Well, two hours later, I hadn't even done a third of it. <laughs> Um, so I came, I, I, I fortunately chose to do the um, eastern shore, which is uh, remoter, because more remote, because the western shore is where the road runs. So I saw the most beautiful uh, parts of the lake, pocket beaches and rocky outcroppings and 
um, little little campgrounds and little teeny tiny uh, areas where maybe six or seven houses were, ended up at the end of the road where the bus picks people up, stopped and had dinner, fresh smoked trout from the, from the lake, and then took the bus back to Bled, ended up getting sick on the bus because it's a very curvy road and I forgot to take my, I get motion sick, forgot to take my medicine, so I had to get off the bus and uh, was I couldn't even consider getting on another bus, so I decided, well, it's no problem. I got a toothbrush with me, which I always carry with me, and I'll just stay overnight. So I found a bed and breakfast, and then the next day uh, was the, the owner of the bed and breakfast said, well, as long as you're here overnight, you should go to Vin Vin Vinker Gorge and hike that. So I went to Vinker Gorge, which was about a three-mile round trip hike on a boardwalk over this amazing gorge, rocky gorge, and the, the, the water is, uh, I don't even know how to describe the color of the water. It's a combination of uh, aquamarine and emerald and, and, you know, waterfalls and rapids and just gorgeous place. And it's those places that just don't get uh, the profile. And if you don't ask around locally, you just don't find out about them, do you? And I think it, it's right. an expectation, isn't it? I've found myself I've been disappointed with places that had a large build up before you get there and it's the ones you don't have plans for it's probably good advice that you said before you don't always plan ahead because you change your plans anyway if you went based on what you heard from other people it's not always the best expectation is it it's not and and I think it's great to have some flexibility now I know not everybody's going to want to travel the way I do um, I get a ticket to a continent I usually go back once a year to visit my family and I stay for a while and and then I get a one-way ticket to a continent I want to go to and I might have a reservation for two or three nights uh, at the first place but then I don't have any other plans and I just decide when I'm done with the place when I've seen everything that I think I want to see I go to the next place and I don't decide what that will be until maybe a day before mm -hmm. and then I you know I look online for what hostels are, are available and we talked about this idea of uh, eating to live or living to eat, and uh, I generally book a hostel where the breakfast is included, and then, like everybody else who stays at a hostel, I shove a couple of rolls and butter and, you know, maybe a jam or something into my pocket for lunch, <laughs> and then the only meal that I have to buy is dinner. And I can, if I'm in a hostel, I can go to the, the grocery store and cook in the hostel because they have shared kitchens. Or people complain, for instance, about Paris being so expensive to eat in. And yeah, the restaurants are expensive, but you can go to the bakery and get a piece of quiche or in the morning, fresh baked bread and some cheese and have an absolutely wonderful meal for next to nothing. Mm. And I guess the best question to ask yourself is, do the locals live expensively? And if they don't, then you maybe need to look at how you're doing it. But a couple of other countries in this region I wanted to talk to you about, Bulgaria and Romania. And I know you spent a bit of time mm. with those. And they're places that interest me because I've talked to a couple of people lately that are in that area, and um, they seem to me to be quite fascinating. What, what's your experience like with them? Both of them are wonderful. Um, I prefer... Um, Bulgaria. Bulgaria is one of my favorite countries in the world um, over Romania, although I would strongly advise people to go to both. Um, the northwest corner of uh, uh, Romania is what we would, we would know the word Transylvania, probably because of the Dracula legend. Uh, and indeed, uh, it is the home of Vlad the Impaler, who was Count Dracul in real life. Uh, and I uh, don't know if you know too much about the history of him, but this whole area of the Balkan Peninsula was overrun and conquered by the Ottomans um, in early history. Uh, and he was, as a child, kidnapped by the Ottomans and raised by them and knew all of their warfare, te warfare techniques, escaped when he was a young man and fought against them. And... Um, got the nickname Vlad the Impaler because he would cut off the heads of his victims and impale them on steel spikes, which he then displayed in the villages. And uh, the Ottomans were terrified of him because he, he knew their tactics. Um, and he is uh, he's the basis for all the Dracula myth. Uh, he's the basis for all the 
um, uh, the books that have been written. And there is a castle in, I think it's Brasov, Romania, outside of Brasov. And it is the book that uh, was written, the famous book about him, the Dracula book. That uh, castle was the inspiration for the book. However, he, he never lived in that castle. So this is, you were talking about tourist traps, essentially, and this is a big tourist trap because uh, people go there thinking that it had something to do with Dracula, and the only thing it was was a setting that the author used for the book. Um, but you can actually go to his real castle. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and again, I can't tell you the name, it escapes me. But Romania is fascinating for its mixture of cultures, for its, um, uh, it has, it's very authentic, especially in um, the uh, Transylvanian area. In fact, I think, is it to travel to? Are you still there? Aren't you guys in Romania? Haven't you been spending time uh, in, in, in that particular area up in a tiny village? I may have that wrong, but uh, the villages there, people are still wear, wearing the traditional dress. Uh, the men wear a little, it's a teeny tiny pillbox hat that's about, you know, that big, and it sits sort of uh, canted on their head like so. Uh, and um, if you, I have, I happen to have friends in Bucharest, in the capital of Romania, and they took me on a tour, um, and they told me about the stories of the remaining days of communism and how the Velvet Revolution proceeded from um, Czechoslovakia into Hungary and, and Romania and how communism ended. It's, it's just, uh, uh, it's uh, got a fascinating history uh, and very Soviet feeling in when you get into the cities, into the developed areas of Romania because so much of the architecture was what they call Soviet brutalism. No decor, you know, a functional only, no attention for art or um, exterior look. Um, Bulgaria, uh, I, I found it very interesting that while the rest of the Balkan Peninsula, the countries were focused on meat and potatoes, Bulgaria really traces their ancestry back to the Thracians, which were a Mediterranean community. And so they're oriented towards the Mediterranean, Mediterranean rather than the, uh, uh, to the, you know, Eastern uh, European cultures. And so their food is a lot of fresh vegetables, uh, feta cheese, salads, uh, again, the peppers, you know, but they have a lot more food that I could eat. Um, it's a, uh, I spent some time in Sofia, the capital <clears throat> of Bulgaria. Uh, it's a wonderful city. A lot of these cities, by the way, have a, what's called a free walking tour. And these are just groups of local people who donate their time and almost any hostel in town, and probably the hotels as well, can tell you about this. Uh, they meet at a certain point, generally 9, 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning, and they do a two to three. In some cases, I've been on, on one that was uh, four hours. Uh, that was in Belgrade. Um, tour that is completely free, and they work for tips only. Uh, and it's a great way to not only get to know the city, get a familiarity so you can find your way around, but also, this is being conducted by people who live there, and they're telling you all the background information. They're telling you mm -hmm. the history and what it's really like to live there, and all the best places to go. Uh, the first place that they took us in Belgrade was the Bohemian District, and they said, if you want to party, this is the place. <laughs> it's, it's local knowledge you're not going to get otherwise, isn't it? And uh, worth the price of admission, which was zero which anyway. Which zero, but, yeah. yeah. A lot of money in terms of the tips they give you. Getting around in Eastern Europe, you said to me just before this call that um, many people associate train travel in west of Europe, but obviously Eastern Europe, you say buses is the best way to go. Yeah, right? you absolutely do not want to take a train in. Um, well, let me qualify that. For instance, in Hungary, uh, they have a, a, a pretty good uh, train infrastructure. It's not in good condition, but they do, uh, they can, you can get from one place to another on the train. But I will tell you, it's not pleasant. Um, they're not air conditioned. The rolling stock is uh, old. Um, and uh, I would say the conductors are less than 
They're not very nice. Let's just put it that way. If you get on a train in Eastern Europe, a couple of things. One is that they often put together cars that are going to different destinations. So for instance, I went from, I think it was Bucharest to Sofia. So Romania to Bulgaria on an overnight train. And I had to make sure that I was getting on uh, not only the right number of, of my coach, but also um, the color uh, because there were five different sets of car of coaches of different colors that were going to five different destinations. So you get on the train at eight o'clock at night um, and, and, and at midnight or one or two in the morning, it stops somewhere and they uncouple everything and they put you onto it. They shunt you onto a different train that's then going to Sofia or Kiev or wherever. And you, if you don't, take great care to make sure you're on the right carriage, the right color. Uh, you, you could end up in the wrong destination in the morning. It happens all well, the you, time. You don't travel, don't you? Why don't you just get on and see where you finish up? Well, I could do that, actually. <laughs> the other thing you need to know about overnight trains in Eastern Europe is um, there's always a, uh, I, I won't call, her, call it a conductor. So often it's a woman. Uh, and I guess maybe she is a conductor because she checks your tickets, but then she'll bring you a pillow, sheets, and a blanket. And you darn well better have that pillow, sheets folded up, blanket folded up in a pile and hand it to her an hour before you get off the train or she will be vicious. Really? Yeah. And they don't tell you. Nobody tells you this stuff. Uh, it is your responsibility to make up your birth and, and then – tear everything out and fold it up and bring it to her long before you uh, arrive at your final destination. And they get very angry if you don't do it. But yes, let me go. Yeah. Let me go back to that. That brings me back to why you should take the bus instead. <laughs> the trains are just disgusting. Um, the bathrooms are so filthy. In fact, most of the trains in Eastern Europe are still the kind where when you flush the toilet, it just opens up and goes onto the track. And this is why you don't, you're not allowed to use the toilet in the station because you'd have human feces all over the station. Um, it, they're, they're so rank that you, you just, you can barely stand the stench. Um, the uh, buses, on the other hand, are fairly modern. Many of them uh, offer Wi-Fi while you're rolling down the road. They're air conditioned. They're comfortable. The seats are great. Um, if you know what you're doing ahead of time, you can make sure that you, and many of them are like double decker buses, you know, and you can make sure that you get a seat in the front uh, seat with the wrap around glass in front of you on the upper level. Um, yeah. And it's a, uh, and the train schedules are not convenient. Uh, often the only trains that will be available will be leaving at a very inconvenient time and arriving at a very inconvenient time. Leaving at 7 o'clock at night and arriving at 4 o'clock in the morning. I try never to get to a new destination in the dark when I don't know the place. I mean, I would fly into Bangkok, you know, any, uh, any hour of the night because I know the place. I know how to get around. But not a good thing to do when you're coming into a, a brand new place where you don't know what the neighborhood is like around the station. And very often, the neighborhoods around the train stations are not good at all. Um, so the buses offer better schedules. They offer better prices. And while a train trip can be 12 hours, a bus trip will al almost always be six or seven or eight. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, is cleanliness an issue through Eastern Europe? You mentioned about, you know, obviously the dirty toilets and what they do on the train. But is it like that in public lavatories? And no, stuff? no, no. It's just the trains. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can have in your hygiene and no. stuff. <laughs> I mean, I love to, to travel by train. And I will, um, uh, again, I was in Mostar in Bosnia-Herzegovina, which was a wonderful town. And normally, I think there are very few trains in Bosnia. Um, and I had come into the country under the impression that there were none. But the people in my hostel, the owners said, oh, no, there is a train that runs from Mostar to Sarajevo. 
and you must take it because even though it takes longer, it goes through some of the most stunning scenery in our country. And indeed it did. It was only two and a half, three hours or something like that. Uh, but I'm really glad I took it. Oh, and I got yeah. that, that train. That's the other thing. In Eastern Europe, you get on the train and it says, no pets, no smoking, right? Everybody is smoking. Everybody in Eastern Europe smokes. Just accept it. People are going to smoke in restaurants, in bars. Nobody cares if they're billowing smoke into your face. I get on the train, and it's one of these uh, compartments that holds six people, you know, with sort of a glass enclosure around it. Um, and I, well, there's only one seat left. I was told, oh, you know, you don't have to worry. You don't even need to get tickets ahead of time because there's always room. Well, there wasn't. And this compartment had five Bosnian men in it. And they were all smoking and passing around the bottle of rakia, which uh, the homemade <laughs> brew, you know. And the one guy was so drunk, he couldn't even stand up. And he would, he would get up and he would like sort of fall over to the edge and, and where he could grab the window on the other side of the aisle and look at the, the scenery going by. And his phone would ring every few seconds and it was his wife screaming at him for being drunk. And <laughs> there was only one guy on the, uh, in the compartment who could speak a little English. And there was obvious they were all taking care of me. You know, they didn't want me to be subject to any kind of abuse from this drink, drunk man who was fine. He was just very drunk. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always an adventure. Barbara, look, it's been a pleasure talking with you today. We could talk all afternoon. Well, afternoon for me, morning for yeah. you, and uh, probably not the night for everyone else who's listening to this. But uh, unfortunately, time's against us. But look, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you for your, sharing your experiences of Eastern Europe. Um, as I say, it's a place I'm fascinated to travel to. I've not been there. Um, and uh, listening to you, it just makes me want to go all the more. So uh, appreciate that, the opportunity. If people want to follow your journey, obviously, um, they can go to your blog at holeinthedonut.com. Yep. Uh, follow your journey there. If they want to know about our podcast, um, you can find us at theexpatchat.com or via iTunes at theexpatchat. So I encourage you to come across there and uh, check that out as well. So. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara, for the opportunity to um, to share your experiences today. And uh, we look forward to talking again soon. Thank you so much for having me. Anytime. Bye, everybody. Right. <laughs> See you later. See you, everyone. <laughs>